Okay, I'm going to get started. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Rebecca Hubbard. I'm the program director of Our Fish, and together with the Oceans and Fisheries Institute of the uh, University of British Columbia, Siena, and Deutsche Umwelt Dilfer, we are hosting today's event, the Science Symposium for Fisheries Management as Climate Action, and it's our opening event on the eve of the UN Ocean Conference. And thank you very much for joining us. We have uh, an amazing lineup of scientists today, both in person and virtually. Uh, unfortunately, all of our group of scientists couldn't be here in person, but um, essentially, just in terms of a little bit of background, Our Fish is a European campaign designed to, or aimed at ending overfishing, and in terms of addressing the biodiversity and climate crisis. And we've been partnering with UBC, and Rashid and I will give you a little bit of background on that in just a minute. Uh, the format for today's event is a series of 10 short presentations, science presentations. So it's, I encourage you to take notes or write questions as we go. We're going to do presentation after presentation, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end, just so that it keeps moving. And they're very entertaining presentations, and they're all different and have uh, their own unique messages. So please write notes if you have questions for them at the end. If you need to go to the toilet, just please make your way there quietly. It's uh, back through and down the corridor as you enter the building. Um, and then, of course, we welcome you to stay and have a drink. Afterwards, for our reception, we'll have some music and, and whatnot. So thank you again for coming. Uh, the existential crisis that we are facing right now has, has been obvious for some time. In 20, back in 2019, the uh, IPVES, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, released their report that um, projected that one million species would be extinct by the end of the century. The same year, the IPCC released their report on one and a half degrees and what we need to do to keep warming to one and a half degrees or not exceed that and the risk and the ramifications of what that might look like. And of course, the state of overfishing and pressures on the ocean has been obvious for some time. Uh, internationally, there's still a third of fish populations overfished, and even in Europe, we have 40% of uh, fish stocks in the Northeast Atlantic being overfished annually. So it's an, it's an obvious problem, and we were looking at our fish at how to end overfishing in EU waters and how this could contribute to addressing the biodiversity crisis, not just looking at single stock fish management, which is the classic approach. And we also started to look at how it could also contribute to climate mitigation and adaptation. But most of the science that was around at that time in 2019 was about how climate change impacted fisheries, not how fisheries could impact climate change and climate mitigation and adaptation. So we approached Dr. Rashid Samela and decided to investigate this issue together. Uh, Rashid, I might hand over to you to describe the process that we then went through with the scientists and develop the, where we got to today. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh... Rebecca, you see, this is one of the reasons I like working a lot with NGOs, right? They're so agile. Our fish, they're so agile, we're having our event before the UN. See? <laughs> so this helps me. It's remarkable as well. That. So, so Beck contacted me and talked about this. Uh, you're right. All these papers are talking about the impact of climate on fish in the ocean. But hey, what we do, what we do on the water, below the water, also can affect climate change. So it's good to bring in this balance. And then we went off and did the first paper, uh, published it. I'll show you a few slides about that. But then the idea started going, right? I mean, what you do with this basic paper, I mean, it, does, it just touches on the issues. So then we talked about doing a special issue 
of a journal that is from CS and Marine Science, and you will hear from the scientists we put together. Many of the papers are already published, at least seven, eight are uh, either published or accepted, and more are coming. So that's what we're going to talk about. It's really cool stuff. Yeah. Okay, so Rashid's actually going to start with the first presentation. Okay, so we have to talk closely into the microphone, Rashid. Okay, so just to introduce Rashid first, um, he is a professor and director of the Fisheries Economics Research Institute at the Institute for Oceans and Fisheries at the University of British Columbia. And he has a raft of very impressive awards and journals and things to his name. Uh, and we're really so grateful for his work and support for this, uh, this series. So I'll hand it over to Rashid to start. Um, and then we'll, we'll move through the rest of the presenters. Thank you. So I'll remember to take it closer. Sometimes I feel like it's going to jump into my mouth when it's not closer. So why is my talk here? Yeah, and, and, and Beck said this, we're really going to try to be very brief. Where is it? Yeah. Hmm? Narrow down. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So we, we're really going to try to be very brief because we believe that we get the best from the interaction, from the questions and the back and forth. So that's the goal. My aim is to talk for just five minutes and that's the same for the other speakers. Five minutes, you can give them plus one minute, they are academic, so I like to talk too much. So we give one minute more, right? And uh, yeah. So this picture is, is, the, is the main picture in the paper I mentioned. Uh, and here we just use this idea of fishing down marine food web to kind of pull out the main elements that are important here about how fishing actually can impact climate change, the emission of CO2 and other things. And if you look there, there are a number of messages. Number one, we are fishing too much. Science says we're using about 2.5 more fishing power than we need to catch fish in the ocean sustainably. So 2.5 power, if you have a linear way of translating it into CO2, that means we are pumping 2.5 times more carbon chasing the fish around, right? Climate change, you just see 2.5. So reduce overfishing and this goes down. So that's point number one. The second point is that we are fishing down the food web. Typically, we go for the big valuable fish first. Daniel Pauli made this famous, right? Fishing down marine food web. You take the big one. People argue with him that as an economist, I just see that that is how people operate, not only in the water. This city, if you take the history of this city, started at the best part of the land here. People just go to the best part, and then it's taken up. They take the next one. Urban planners will tell you, you have rings of development around cities. The same thing that's fishing down marine food web, right? And, and so we're taking the big one. And when we do that, we truncate the fish web. This is where your point about it. It's not just single species. So you are squishing down the food web, which is made for a purpose, right? This system wasn't just there for nothing. Fish eat fish, they, they, they play together, have fun together, but they know how to live together if we leave them alone. That's the food web. And it has a purpose, so when we truncate it, we are weakening the system. And when you weaken the system, you are making it more vulnerable to all sorts of shocks, including climate change, right? So that is another thing to, to watch out. I say that COVID is in our minds all over. If you are healthy and you are hit by COVID, you're most likely going to survive. If you have pre-existing conditions, oh my gosh, hopefully you will survive, right? So it's the same thing. Fish and people are the same, so you truncate the food web. And also, these big animals, as you hear from my colleagues, actually do a lot of sequestration of the, of the carbon, right? So we are taking that. Third point is, look at the, look at the x-axis there. With time, the richness of the habitats in the ocean are being taken down. Think of bottom trawling, scraping the bottom. So it's taken down natural capital that actually helps us also with squashing carbon, right? These are taken down. So I think this big picture actually captures quite a lot of what you will hear uh, as we move in the day. 
So that's the point I'm saying. These circles are just telling you various ways that our fishing actually can affect the amount of carbon we emit and also disturb the storage of carbon by animals and natural habitats in the system. And again, we will you'll be hearing elements of this as we go from, from our group here. This is a picture we had in our first, uh, uh, in the first paper. And to me, it just also tells us the kind of problem we have. At the moment, I think a lot of what we do reinforces negative feedback from people to nature and nature to people. What do I mean by that? I could talk for an hour about this because there are all sorts of examples. Subsidies, for example, right? 80% goes to live scale fishing boats, 20% to coastal. That's crazy, right? So, so coastal people in West Africa who depend on fish, if you're hungry, you will hang on the last fish. So you give the money to the big boats, they catch and com outcompete them. It's just crazy. So, so that is the kind of thing. Climate change is also another example. Overfishing is another. Whatever we do, we should try to ensure that we encourage positive feedback from people to nature and nature to people, all our policies and actions. At the moment, we are not doing that. And that's one message I would like to leave with you. Like I said, there's a lot to say here, but that is the main point. When you overfish, you are weakening the system, and then it's not able to support the people it needs to support. Then they go harder on the remaining fish, and then you vicious cycle. We got to break that. And uh, some of the talks here will, will help us do that. So here are a few more words. Strengthen the ocean, making it more capable of withstanding climate change impact. That's if we end overfishing, reduce overfishing, stop overfishing. And that will contribute to climate mitigation. You'll hear more from technical people on this side, science based people. A healthy person is more likely to survive. I've already told, mentioned this. In this way, people and the ocean are not that different. I like to make this. You know, sometimes people, we think we are completely different from nature, but we are just the same. We have a little big brain, so that, that we, we, can, we can make conscious decisions. But actually, a lot of the things are similar. Finally, here is something. So, so here is something to ponder. Yes. Just to give you an idea, we take about 100 million tons of fish out of the ocean each year, legally and illegally, as uh, an estimate. 100 million tons, that is a lot of biomass, you know. And if you convert this, many of you would have heard me say this before, if you convert this to the number of mature cows, that is at least 100 million mature fish cows in terms of weight that we drag out of the system. Just think about it, which system can sustain that year in, year out, 100 million tons. That's more than all the cows we slaughter a year on land, so that's huge. So you got to think about the consequences of that. Number is that how we do the fishing, bottom trawling and other ways we fish destroys a lot of things. So please think about that when you think about how we can manage the ocean. This is massive and it has effect on climate change in so many different ways. Thank you very much. I think I'll stop here for the next person. Thank you very much, Rishi. Okay, so. Next up, we have a presentation from Angela Martin. Unfortunately, Angela can't be with us because she was fortunate enough to bring a, another fish protector into the world very recently. So Angela is a research fellow for the Center for Coastal Research at the University of Agder, Norway. So we have a video from Angela now. Hi, I'm Angela. Thank you very much to our fish for organizing and hosting this session and to those in the audience for your interest in the topic of ending overfishing as a positive action for climate. My colleagues and I were interested to see what effect ending overfishing and rebuilding, rebuilding stocks would have on the carbon footprint of a fishery. We looked at a fishery with a recently depleted stock that had since recovered somewhat and compared the carbon footprint of fishing the stock under these different statuses. The carbon footprint of fisheries includes, but is not limited to, emissions from processing and distribution, 
as well as fuel and disturbance of ecosystem carbon. In our case, we use the publicly available landings and effort data collected by STEC-F, combined with ISIS spawning stock biomass estimates, which is the reproductive adult portion of a stock. This data allowed us to focus on just a few aspects of the carbon footprint, namely the fuel used for travel and for fishing, the area of potentially carbon-rich sediment disturbed, carbon in fish bodies removed by fishing and the subsequent carbon emissions, and the remaining carbon in the reproductive adult stock. We didn't consider other sources of emissions from the fishery. Our work focused on the northern and southern stocks of European hake. On this map, the northern stock is comprised of all the light blue shaded sections, with the exception of 8C and 9A, which are in the red square. These constitute the southern stock. ISIS estimates the population of reproductive age hake in the northern stock, but not the southern stock. In 2004, the northern stock of adult hake was very low and a recovery plan was introduced to reduce the fishing mortality by 70%. Between 2008 and 2016, the northern stock of adult hake increased by approximately sixfold. We therefore used the STEC-F data from 2008 and 2016 to compare the carbon footprint for the depleted and recovered stocks. Just to cover the main limitations of our study, the landings and fuel data are from a mixed fishery, which means that emissions cannot be attributed solely to the hake landings. We therefore used the data only to compare 2008 and 2016, and not as an absolute estimate for emissions associated with hake landings. Furthermore, to ensure that we could get this as accurate as possible, we focused on the three countries with the highest hake landings. We took the higher hake landings as an indication that these fisheries were specifically targeting hake. Uh, ISIS estimates the population of reproductive age hake in the northern stock, but not the southern stock, However, it was not possible to disaggregate the STEC-F landings data by northern or southern stock. So we used the northern stock stand, um, spawning stock biomass as a proxy for both stocks in our analysis. We have only estimated the area of sediment disturbance for mud to muddy sand, which are sediment types associated with higher carbon content, as we were unable to estimate specific carbon disturbance. We have not considered emissions from other sources associated with the different stock statuses, such as hake imports, which were higher in 2008 when hake stock was low than they were in 2016 when the stock had recovered. Different fishing gears affect the amount of fuel used and some of the fishing gears can disturb sediment to the point that it releases organic carbon into the water. So we made separate estimates for each of the three main gear types used in the fishery. These were trawlers, whose gear is actively dragged along the seafloor, sea and two types of passive gears, drift nets and hooks, which do not interact with the seafloor. So these were the results for fuel efficiency. You can see that fuel efficiency was lower in 2008 when the stock was depleted and improved in 2016 when the hake population had recovered. With the recovered stock, there were fewer emissions from fuel per kilogram of hake for each of the three main gear types, as well as for all of the gear types combined. For sediment disturbance, we considered only the trawler section of the fishery, since this is the gear that interacts with the sediment. We calculated the swept area, or SA, a measure of the area disturbed for the sediment type mud to muddy sands. As I mentioned earlier, these are sediment types associated with higher carbon content. Our results showed that the disturbance by trawlers was greater per kilogram of hake landed in 2016 when the stock had recovered. However, during the research, we also noted that the proportion of hake landed by trawlers was greatly reduced in 2016 and more were caught using passive gear types. So that could have a confounding effect on these results. Regardless, we applied this method to estimate disturbance by trawling in the hope that future studies will be able to build on this to include the carbon content of the sediment disturbed, and from there, the likely release of carbon by trawling into the water column and subsequently back into the atmosphere. For carbon in fish bodies, we estimated emissions of carbon in kilograms from the landed fish. In 2008, with fewer fish landed by all gear types but trawling, the emissions from the landings were naturally lower when the stock was depleted compared to the larger volume of landings, which was made possible once the stock was restored. However, 
the carbon in the adult stock in 2016 was more than six times higher than in 2008. Thus, emissions from the fishery as a proportion of the carbon in the stock were much greater in 2008 when the stock was depleted. 96% of the carbon in the adult biomass was landed compared to 2016 when the stock had been rebuilt and only 31% was removed. So overall, we found that when the stock was recovered, the fuel efficiency improved, carbon in the bodies of the adult stock was higher, the proportion of carbon emitted from the stock was lower. However, the total fuel used by the fishery did increase from 2008 to 2016 which is likely a result of increased fishing activity made possible by the larger stock size in 2016. So ending overfishing can also increase fishing opportunities. On this point, it's worth noting that in 2008, to make up for the reduced landings of the European hake, it is likely that imports from further afield were increased. This would have had an effect on the fuel emissions of hake available in European markets. However, that was beyond the, the scope of our research. Thank you very much for your time. So the next uh, presentation, unfortunately, Dr. Sebastian Villasante can't be with us. He's actually on the way from A Coruña. His flight was delayed, uh, and so he's driving. <laughs> but he is not going to make it here in time, unfortunately. Uh, he was meant to present uh, in person. Uh, so we'll move on. Uh, and if I can work out how to bring him here virtually, I will do that in the process. So in the meantime, the next presentation is from Erica Ferrer, who is an NSF graduate student researcher at the University of California, San Diego at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Hi everyone, my name is Erica Ferrer and I'm a fifth year PhD candidate at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego, California. I study small scale fisheries and the manifestations of climate change in the marine environment. During my time as a student, I've been quite privileged to work with data collected by colleagues in Mexico in collaboration with fishers in and around the Baja California Peninsula via the Gulf of California Marine Program. In the first chapter of my dissertation, my colleagues and I performed what's known as a cradle to gate life cycle analysis designed to ascertain the carbon footprint of various seafoods produced by small scale fisheries in Baja. A large part of the motivation for this work was to understand and indeed elevate the profile of small scale fisheries and their contributions to sustainable seafood. What we found was that while the carbon footprint of some seafoods such as shrimp can be high, there are several low emission seafoods being produced by small scale fisheries in the region. Now, the disparity between certain types of seafood classes, let's call them, is first order probably best explained by the type of gears used to fish them. What I found remarkable though, was the wide amount of variability within class. And I had a hunch that at least part of this might be explained by the underlying stock status in the fisheries themselves. Shortly after beginning to ponder this idea seriously, my hunch was corroborated by the scholarship of Rasid Somalia and Travis Tai. In their paper, they explain how ending overfishing will help to create more climate resilient fisheries and may even lower the emissions associated with the fishing sector. The work I'm presenting today builds upon this idea, suggesting that by decreasing the extent of overfishing, fishers will likely catch greater amounts of fish for lesser amounts of fuel. So really, this work is grounded in the concept of increasing catch per unit effort. Using the same data set for the first chapter of my thesis, which like I mentioned, was collected by scientists and fishers in Baja, in combination with fisheries landings data provided by the Mexican government, my colleagues and I were able to test the relationship between relative stock biomass and fuel intensity per kilogram of seafood. Now, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go into the full methods used to generate the results I'm about to show you. But if you're curious to learn more, I recommend you check out the article we've been working on, which will soon be published in Frontiers in Marine Science. Here's what we saw in terms of the raw data shown in panel A. On the x-axis of this figure, we have the ratio of estimated biomass, B, to biomass at maximum, maximum sustainable yield, BMSY. The ratio of B to BMSY tells us about the stock status and is a proxy for overfishing. On the Y axis, we have fuel intensity, that is the amount of fuel needed to land one kilogram of wet weight seafood. Panel B, on the other hand, is essentially a summary of panel A that shows the XY coordinates mean by each unique fishery in a given year. 
So for example, one of these points represents some mean of individual fishing trips in a given fishery during some year. Here's what we see when we apply a mixed effects model or simple linear regression to these data. In general, we see that the seafood generated by fisheries with a biomass below MSY has a higher fuel intensity than seafood derived from fisheries with a biomass above MSY. It's worth noting that this relationship holds up under a variety of model parameterizations and robustness checks. For example, we still observe this inverse relationship when accounting for gear type as a fixed effect with genus and year as random effects. These results lend credence to the idea that an end to overfishing would lower the carbon footprint associated with seafood and fisheries. And happily, there exist many strategies for accomplishing this. In Mexico, for example, the Community Catch Monitoring Program in the Upper Gulf of California has helped to stabilize the Gulf Corvina fishery over the last decade. And the SICPA Cooperative, which governs fishing in the town of Punta Riojos, has helped to ensure the town's fishing success over multiple generations. There also exists a rather robust body of literature which discuss, discusses strategies for ending overfishing around the world. Many of these strategies are promising and worthy of fuller discussion, but I'll conclude with a few of the ones that I've spent some time thinking about and find particularly relevant to small scale fisheries. First, I think eliminating harmful fishing subsidies which flow overwhelmingly to industrial fisheries while supporting those that are beneficial and flow towards small scale fisheries will be a great place to start. Dr. Samalia and his colleagues at UBC have published a number of important studies on this topic. Second, we must protect small scale fisheries from exclusionary or exploitative fishing and management practices, including those conducted by industrial fisheries and other large scale industry interests. And finally, I think it's worth investing many hours and funds into socially just restoration and conservation of ecosystems upon which healthy fisheries depend. With that, I'll conclude and thank you very much for your time. Please feel free to contact me and check out our paper later this month. Okay, so the next person we have up is uh, Professor William Chung. Uh, William is an IPCC lead author, excellent, and um, professor and director of the Institute of Oceans and Fisheries at UBC and has been with the, um, with the project, shall we call it, from the beginning as well. Thank you so much, William, if you'd like to come and present. It's wonderful to have you in there. Thank you very much, Beck. Thanks. Thanks very much, all. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, the follow-up on the various presentations that colleagues have made uh, highlighting the contributions of uh, ending overfishing to climate mitigation. But then to have the effects of ending overfishing uh, to be effective in climate mitigation, we need to also consider um, climate change when we develop a uh, fish stock rebuilding plan. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, uh, my studies uh, conclude that uh, we need a more conservation-focused biomass rebuilding plan in order to actually make uh, biomass rebuilding uh, climate adaptive so that it can contribute positively to climate change as well. Oh, I have to close to the mic. <laughs> Sorry. So a substantial number of fish stocks in the world are overexploited with the biomass substantially lower than historical level or the level that is expected to deliver sustainable yield. Some fish stocks in some regions are better than the other. So for example, this map shows the fish stocks uh, that are assessed in the European waters. Um, there's a remarkable uh, north south gradient there. Um, we have uh, less uh, overexploitation in the north, uh, for example, in Barents Sea or Norwegian Sea compared to the south. Uh, where there are much more overexploited stocks, such as in the Mediterranean or in the Black Sea. The common fisheries policy in Europe uh, calls for rebuilding for all commercially important fish stocks about levels that are capable of delivering a maximum sustainable yield. As other colleagues said, there are many good reasons why we need to stop overfishing. Climate change is an added reason. Uh, in addition to all the other social, ecological, and economic benefits that we know already about uh, from uh, rebuilding fish stock. However, rebuilding plants also need to incorporate climate change in order to be effective. 
Our study shows that biomass of many fish stocks in European waters will likely be further reduced under climate change. The impacts of climate change on stock biomass also increases with emissions and global warming levels. Therefore, under climate change, the effectiveness of re rebuilding will actually be decreased. For example, with a weak climate mitigation scenario and thus a high global warming level, biomass, biomass of sensitive stocks and regions are projected to be lower than the current, even the overexploited level. Therefore, more conservative or conservation-focused rebuilding plan is needed in order to make biomass rebuilding climate adaptive. In order, to, in order to put this into a more quantitative ground, we use computer simulation models combined with global fisheries and biological database to analyze the effects of climate change on our rebuilding plan and what we need to do in order to make it climate adaptive. These models uh, have been developed with uh, my team and I for the, over the last uh, decade or so, and we have been applying it uh, for over the world. What we find is that, um, the, as we said, under uh, the worst case scenario in this figure, and the first row, under the overexploited scenario, and with a low mitigation, so high climate change scenario, the first upper left uh, cell, there is a remarkable drop in biomass that will end up in this scenario with biomass of fish, fish stocks uh, uh, in Europe uh, for uh, 10 to 16% of its uh, historical uh, pre-industrial unexploited level. Even with a target of achieving maximum sustainable yield, which is the current um, policy under the uh, common fisheries policy, with climate change, uh, even with a strong mitigation, it is not enough to achieve at least half of the biomass uh, recovery to half of its historical level. It is only with a conservation-focused target, which is at least 25% lower fishing than the level that is required to achieve maximum sustainable yield, that we can rebuild biomass back to a level that is about 50% uh, of, um, of, of the pre-industrial uh, un unexploited level. And that it leads to also combined with a strong carbon mitigation as well. So in summary, a conservation-focused biomass recruiting plan is needed, which includes managing fishing efforts. Also, in our analysis, which I didn't show in today, we add a scenario with marine protected areas. And we find that with a scenario of 30% marine protected areas in European water, it can also substantially increase the effectiveness of rebuilding plan, particularly for overexploited regions and stocks. What we need is a portfolio of ocean-based solutions to deal with climate change. These include sustainable fisheries management, transformation to low-carbon ocean economy, as well as other nature-based solutions, uh, such as protecting critical habitat, setting up protected area as well. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, William. And I won't begin to uh, comment on all of these presentations because there's so much to say and you can see that we have a, a wealth of, um, of different approaches and, and analysis of the different ways that really ending overfishing, restoring fish populations can really help to mitigate and improve adaptation to climate change as well. So with the next presentation, Miguel, I'll ask you to come and put this video on. Uh, so Ibrahim is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute for Oceans and Fisheries at the UBC as well, and uh, he presentation on how. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ibrahim Isifu. I work at uh, University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. I, I would like to acknowledge being gratefully located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish and the Musqueam nations. I want to talk today about the impact of ocean warming 
overfishing, mercury on European fisheries, a risk assessment and policy solution framework. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who collaborated for this study. We focused on 38 uh, exclusive economic zones of, of 27 European countries in the European Food and Agriculture Organization region. Our supplementary materials can be found online at the frontiers. We focus especially on the Northeast Atlantic area, which is a shaded rectangle uh, you can find in the, in, the, in the map. The Northeast area is one of the highest ranking areas for both carbon sink and fishing intensity. And it is responsible for, for about 14 to 15% of global carbon sink and global fishing effort. This map was retrieved and modified from Sierra Nasa. Uh, our study, as we talked about, is about climate change, the interaction of climate change, overfishing, and mercury. So we take a look at the study also monitored the levels of mercury in some commercial species in the European zone. So we have uh, the various species, but you can see from the figure or from this table that most of the fish species have mercury concentration level less than 0 0.3. And 0 0.3 mg per milligram is the recommended US Environmental Protection Agency guideline for mercury level in what in uh, European or in fisheries. But swordfish has ridiculously high level of mercury concentration. Uh, we look at the interpretation of our temperature tolerance index, or we use the temperature tolerance index to compute how sensitive fish species will be exposed to climate change. So we, we, we found out that if they, we compute an index, if the total if the temperature to, uh, tolerance index is greater than one, then it means that fishes cannot, their resilience will be weakened if they are exposed to warming uh, oceans due to climate change. But if the estimated TTI, which is the temperature tolerance index, is equal to one, it means that no exposure to thermal stress uh, will be harmful to fish, fish species. On the other hand, if the TTI is less than one, the projected uh, temp changes in temperature or sea surface temperature is still within the temperature preference range of the fish species, which implies that the species can still tolerate extreme STTI, sea surface temperature anomalies, and survive under climate change. So they will present a diagram that tells us the relationship between TTI on the vertical axis and MTT, which is the mean temperature tolerance on the horizontal axis. This panel figure will have A, B, C, and D. There's a positive correlation between TTI and MTT. And it is significantly linear regression. And you can also see that most of the fish species are below from that from the, the figures A, B, and C. Most of the fish species are below our TTI index of one, which means that projected increase in temperature will not adversely affect our fish species. RCP, which is the representative concentration pathway, we have RCP 2.6, which is low emissions and strong mitigation. By RCP 8.5, which means that business as usual or high emissions. So by the year 2100, we have seen that under strong or high emissions or business as usual, which is figure D, you can see that some of our fish species are above the TTI 1 index value of 1. Example like red mullet, 
uh, great Atlantic scallop fraud fish. So this means that changes in temperature is going to adversely affect the resilience of this fish species. So let's look at the top findings. Our, our five temperate beta, beta pelagic or bottom and midwater species, especially like Norway lobster, common sole, great Atlantic scallop, rare mullet, and European sea bass, as well as our much cherished European hake will be negatively be affected in terms of abundance and distribution by high increase in sea surface temperature under the high emission scenarios. Mercury concentration or mercury contamination is estimated to increase in some fish species, about 50% in swordfish, exceeding mercury consumption guideline threshold of less than one. This negative impact may limit the capacity of fisheries and marine ecosystems to respond to the current climate-induced pollution sensitivity. And ongoing global efforts aim at minimizing carbon footprint and emission need to be enhanced in concert with reduction in fisheries to, main, to maintain effective conservation measures that promote increased resilience of fisheries to climate change and other stresses. Reduction in fishing intensity including measures that promote social resilience within the fishing sector while maintaining effective conservation measures will increase resilience of the fisheries. Such strategies include enhancing transferable fishing quota, alternative fisheries and livelihood diversification, especially for coastal communities. Thank you very much for organizing this uh, symposium and we appreciate your feedback. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Charlotte de Fontebert, who is the global lead for the Blue Economy at World Bank. And uh, Charlotte will give us another perspective on the interactions with fisheries and climate. OK. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. My name is Charlotte de Fontbert. I am the global lead for the blue economy at the World Bank. First, let me start by thanking our fish, Beck, and UBC. A lot of friendly faces, uh, including people who have helped me in this presentation. I was going to give a, a really detailed presentation, but I just want to start with one thing, uh, because I think we need to listen to what everybody else is saying and comment as we go along which is we wrote a report on overfishing and overcapacity a few years ago. It's called Sunken Billions. It's available on the bank's web website and I will share. And we showed something really striking, which is that by reducing overcapacity, by reducing fishing effort, we can actually catch more fish by fishing less. So I think, I think we just to hold on to this for a sec. We need less boats, we need to burn less fuel, and we can contribute much less to GHG emissions and yet land more fish. So I think right there, I don't want this to be, take over the whole symposium, but I'd like everybody to, uh, to remember this. So I am going to talk today a little bit, again, I have uh, changed my presentation um, slightly. I am going to talk a little bit about what the World Bank is doing on marine fisheries in Africa. Uh, a few years ago, we started thinking a little bit like our fish does about the interaction between climate and uh, fisheries. And we wanted to look specifically at the African continent. At first, we thought we were going to look for a striking example that would help decision makers really think about climate change when they think about their fisheries. But our findings were perhaps even more striking than we imagined. And um, we came up with some slightly different conclusions. The report is available online. I'm not going to talk about the modeling, not least because everything was done by William Chung right here, um, the IPCC expert. Lesson number one, work with the best people and your report is going to look good. Um, but just to go very quickly over some um, main issues, we did look at a range of scenarios, some optimistic, others less so. There were two different models, grab William for the details. Um, but what we wanted to do is a comparative relative analysis of how climate change was going to strike the continent from two very, very important different aspects, from what was going to happen in the water and then what's going to happen 
for the people who are engaged in those fisheries. So ecological impacts on the one hand and socio-ecological impacts on the other. Again, with the contributions from Dr. Vicky Lam from uh, UBC. Um, so we, we were looking at ecological risks. I'm gonna give you some results with maps. I think everything is, looks better with maps. And again, this idea of, is there a difference between what's gonna happen in the water, which is on the left, and then what's going to happen for people, which is on the right. And the big difference here, the number one thing here, is fisheries management, or lack thereof. So we're talking, this symposium is about the interaction between climate change and, and fisheries management. So right there we were showing that, just look at the countries that change in color. And this is a relative rankings, but still you have some striking results on the right where countries with appropriate fisheries management can alleviate some of those impacts. So the message that we gave again and again was nothing is a foregone conclusion. It's not up to fate, it's not up to the emitters. At the end of the day, it is going to be about the coastal countries of Africa. There are so many things that can be done to alleviate, mitigate, and adapt to the impacts of climate change. Okay, so this is what I'm going to talk about a little bit now, is those management measures. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, we already know um, a lot of what needs to be done. Um, but I, as I was presenting, I was preparing this presentation, I was working with um, Rashid and William on another project on subsidies, and then it just struck me like lightning that whenever we look either at climate change or we look at um, subsidies, it's the, the delta, that the variable is always whether or not you have effective fisheries management in place. So let me explain the difference here. In the case of uh, climate change, if you have better fisheries management, you're actually gonna be able to, remember, catch fish less but catch more. And in the case of subsidies, we were looking at what is the impact of subsidies on those fisheries. And we got really down with a couple of models. We got down to it depends on what you're doing with your fisheries management. So I, I just want, I would like everybody to think about this and um, uh, think about how you can adapt to this in, in real life. I work for the World Bank. We have a $7 billion portfolio. We have more than a billion dollars in uh, fisheries. So how we carry out our operations in fisheries is now really taking on, on board this aspect of is climate change, um, how we adapt to climate change. And again, it, it's, it's, it's really, and I like what you said, Rashida, it's a two-way street. Climate is gonna have an impact on fisheries. Fisheries, how we fish is also gonna have an impact on uh, climate change. And I, I'm gonna leave you on, on a high note, which is that about five years ago, we did, this, um, we did this report on climate and fish in Africa. And we are now in the situation at the World Bank where the colleagues in Africa who worked on this are talking to the colleagues in Indonesia, uh, including at the government level, and we're trying to replicate this really groundbreaking work we did with UBC, uh, and we're trying to adapt the model and uh, refine it for other regions. So I can tell you um, publicly and very openly that the, bank is, the World Bank is taking this very, very seriously. We're gonna keep working on this, and we're gonna be looking yet again for more partners. Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant, thanks Charlotte. We especially love positive stories. And that's really what this, actually what this symposium is about, is to really demonstrate that um, fisheries management is a solution. It's this amazing, quite direct, quite pragmatic solution to climate change, or one of the many, of course, reducing directly uh, greenhouse gas emissions is extremely important. But this is, you know, it is a direct solution and one that we can very, as Charlotte said, very practically and very easily address and we, we know what those solutions are. So um, the next uh, presentation we have is from Laura Blaney, uh, one of my Antipodean colleagues. Uh, Laura is a quantitative marine ecologist with the CSIRO Oceans and Atmosphere in Australia. 
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Blamey, and I'm joining you today from Australia. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands and the sea on which, on which we live and work on across Australia, and pay out my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So as many of you are well aware, our climate is rapidly changing and fisheries management needs to be able to be robust to this change. But because the systems we work in are so highly variable, it can sometimes be difficult to integrate environmental variability or climate directly into fisheries management decisions. And indeed, there are fewer stock assessments or harvest strategies that actually explicitly include environmental drivers. So today in this presentation, I'm providing three case studies from Northern Australia that show a combination of novel modeling approaches, such as management strategy evaluation, as well as novel design of harvest strategies and how they can be used to test robustness of fisheries management approaches to extreme environmental variability and to help guide decision makers. The first case study I'm presenting is the Besh de Mer fishery, which is an important indigenous fishery in northeastern Australia. This resource has previously been identified as at risk from both fishing and climate impacts. And CSIRO has worked with stakeholders and communities to come up with alternative ways to manage the fishery. Some of these include spatial closures, spatial rotation, um, and monitoring through surveys. These different approaches have been tested using management strategy evaluation, um, and they include testing these strategies under increased climate risks to this fishery. After running these management strategy evaluations, we found that business as usual um, sort of a approach to fisheries management increased risk to the stock with half the species falling below target levels while other times there were moderate risks for the overall and local depletion of the stock, as well as significant changes in species composition. However, by taking a spatial and adaptive management approach, this was able to reduce the risk to the stock, whilst also maintaining profits for the fishers. Another case study that we've looked at is the tropical rock lobster. The tropical rock lobster is also an important fishery and a source of livelihood across northern Australia. And unlike their cold water counterparts, these tropical rock lobsters are short lived and their abundance is highly variable. In the Torres Strait, every year these lobsters undergo a long one way migration out of the Torres Strait across into Papua New Guinea, where they then breed. The larvae that are then released are then rely on these complex oceanic processes to be able to return them back to the Torres Strait where they then settle and so the life cycle continues. However, the variability and complexity of these oceanogra oceanogra uh, oceanographic processes means that the recruitment is difficult to predict. So here we used a novel fishing rule um, or we developed a novel fishing rule, which is an empirical rule that relies heavily on an annual pre-season survey. So not just your usual indices of abundance, such as catch per unit effort, but instead a, a survey that takes place before the fishing season starts. And this helps inform on the upcoming lobster recruitment for the next year. And the catch recommendations can then be adjusted accordingly. This novel harvest strategy has been tested also using management strategy evaluation and is found to be risk to or has found to be robust to um, increased risks to the under climate change, but also more recently to COVID through disruptions of and um, of the fishery and supply. Finally, the third case study that I just want to touch on um, looks at red leg banana prawns, which are caught along the northern Australia coastline um, and contribute to one of Australia's most important Commonwealth fisheries. Like many prawn species, red leg, red leg banana prawns are also short lived and they're highly variable and their life cycles influenced by the climate. Some of our recent work has shown that in El Nino years and also years with um, extremely low rainfall, these can be, this can be correlated with low prawn abundance and the lowest ever catches were recorded during the extreme 2015-2016 El Nino. Given that these ENSO events, El Ninos and La Ninas, are predicted to become more variable in the future, we worked closely with stakeholders and tested how different fishing rules might impact both prawns and the fishers themselves under these extreme ENSO years. 
In the end, stakeholders opted to go for a seasonal closure of the fishery. This was found to perform best um, under overall and it also reduced the risk to both the fishery and the prawn stock in extreme El Nino years, showcasing another good example of practical solutions to be able to adapt to climate impacts. Finally, to end, I'll just summarize with a few take-home messages from these case studies. First, business as usual fisheries management may increase risk to stocks under future climate uncertainty. And accounting for, the, for this uncertainty in the way we stimulate um, these, these fisheries and test different fishing rules can help safeguard stocks under changing climate. But often including hypothesized environmental relationships into models does not necessarily improve the model performance. Often it's preferable to account for these relationships in the fishing rules themselves. So hence, even if an environmental relationship is not fully understood, it is still possible to include it in the harvest strategy to adjust and to address the harvest strategy and allow for greater precaution in managing the stock under future environmental uncertainty. Thanks for listening and I'm sure our panel will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Excellent. So now again, we are privileged to have uh, Professor Alex Rogers here with us today. Uh, Alex is the Director of Science at Rev Ocean and uh, his presentation will give a really lovely overview of a lot of these aspects that have been discussed in this presentation. Um, so, folks, I'm going to kind of wind out a bit now in terms of uh, thinking about carbon and fisheries and the marine environment in general. So, what is blue carbon? Well, obviously, it's where the marine environment is active in sequestering uh, our emissions. Storage must be for a long time. It has to be influenced by human intervention. And it's important in terms of considering the implications of the loss of marine ecosystems. And we first started to think about this in context of coastal ecosystems, particularly mangrove forests, salt marshes, and seagrass meadows where carbon is actually captured in the living tissues of those organisms, but also in the sediments trapped by them. So there's a huge amount of carbon locked up in the sediments trapped by seagrasses and so on. Um, kelp forests uh, or macroalgal forests were initially not considered here because they don't have this trapped sediment and we weren't really uh, aware of where their carbon was going. More recently it's been realised that these ecosystems are extremely extensive and although they don't capture carbon in situ they do export carbon to other ecosystems. And in fact, where some of those other uh, coastal carbon ecosystems are capturing uh, basically tens of millions of tons of carbon per annum, seaweed forests may be capturing up in the hundreds of millions of tons per annum. So they may be very important in this context. But we've started to think more broadly about blue carbon in the ocean. And the first lines of thinking about this were with whales. So whales capture carbon in terms of their biomass. They die and sink into the deep ocean where that carbon is sequestered. But also it was realized that through their feeding processes, they bring iron up into surface waters where it stimulates more primary production particularly in low iron zones of the, uh, of the ocean. And again, this helps to sequester CO2. But if we look at this quantitatively, it's a relatively small contribution compared to those coastal ecosystems we've seen. However, this is the tip of the iceberg. And now we're realizing there are many other processes out in the open ocean which contribute to this carbon capture and sequestration over uh, longer, longer time periods. 
I think one of the questions we've got to ask is whether human activity can actually influence carbon capture through these new mechanisms we've been looking at. I think the short and simple answer to that question is yes. So, for example, through the effects of climate change, we can see impacts on ocean primary production, reduced productivity of fish populations, which William and others have already spoken about today, but also the impacts of fishing, which has been discussed uh, earlier in this session. It's not just overfishing which is a problem, it's also the impacts of the types of fishing uh, which we're currently executing in the ocean. This is just an excerpt from a paper that was published last year where it was estimated that bottom trawling is releasing up to half a billion tonnes of carbon from ocean sediments per annum. Uh, and this figure, of course, actually dwarfs the amount of carbon which is being fixed by these coastal carbon ecosystems, even considering them collectively. So the types of fishing we are doing is also a very important consideration as well as the amount we're fishing as well. One area that uh, particularly interests me is carbon capture through active carbon transport. So as you're aware, uh, in the oceans we have the lar largest migration uh, occurring every single day. This wave of marine life ascending into surface waters at night time where they feed and then diving into the deep ocean when the sun rises. And through this migration, carbon is transported from the surface into the deep ocean. This active transport is responsible for transporting, it's estimated, 900 to 3,500 million tonnes of carbon uh, per annum into the deep ocean where it's sequestered. And of course, now we're considering fishing these mesopelagic stocks of life. And here, even taking a small percentage of these organisms has the potential to have a large impact on carbon sequestration in these ecosystems. So, just to summarise all that, uh, coastal blue, blue carbon is recognised now as a certifiable mechanism of carbon sequestration. Oceanic blue carbon has enormous potential and is clearly impacted by human activities. We need more research to understand uh, these mechanisms and to quantify the amount of carbon being sequestered and how it's being sequestered. And ocean management, including of fisheries, can clearly reduce not only direct carbon emissions, such as fuel use, but also indirect uh, emissions through things like habitat destruction. And finally, understanding of sequestration by macroalgae is increasing, uh, and indeed uh, seaweed farming may be a way of kind of formally uh, certifying this in terms of carbon capture. Thank you, Alex. So, such a helpful overview of the whole uh, ocean carbon cycle. So to finish, we have two recordings. We have one of the authors in the audience to join us for the panel, which is fantastic. But the next, um, the next recording is from Marta Ustaik, and who's a research associate at the World Maritime University, and Laura Elsler, who is the co-lead of DEI and Early Career Ocean Professionals Program. And Laura will join us on the panel afterwards. Uh, and here we go. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining our presentation. Um, and thank you to our fish for organizing this symposium. My name is Marcia Oostijk and I'm a postdoc at World Maritime University. And I'll be presenting today with Laura Elsler on the governance of open ocean and fish carbon. The ocean is the biggest carbon sink on the planet. Plants and animals play a big role in the carbon sequestration by the ocean through two main processes. So plankton, Fish and whales contribute to passive uh, carbon fixation with their biomass. This carbon is stored in food webs or can be exported through deadfalls to the seafloor. 
Vertical migrations of fish and zooplankton also actively export carbon into the deep ocean. These animals feed at the surface and excrete carbon at depth. One important region in the ocean where a lot of the vertical migration is occurring is called the mesopelagic zone and is seen in the figure as the twilight zone. We were curious if these carbon sequestration ecosystem surfaces in these, of these animals are protected, and if not, what governance frameworks and tools could be used to protect them? We had interviews with 20 key actors in this field uh, and asked them questions on how uh, these ecosystem surfaces could be protected. Key actors promoted ocean carbon by bridging science and policies and providing scientific input to negotiations. We found that these key actors largely focused on the UNFCCC as a governance framework, but we also found oppositions against introducing fish and ocean carbon at this, at this framework. We found that interna international fisheries management and a draft agreement for biodiversity protection beyond na uh, national jurisdictions uh, are promising paths for future governance of these ecosystem services. Together with the um, actors, we drew a timeline which shows uh, going back all the way to 2009 um, that oceans have already been introduced in discussions around the UNFCCC. What key actors thought was uh, one of the kind of turning points for ocean related carbons was the, the International Monetary Fund um, report on whale carbon that policymaking really started to take those services more, more seriously. The Our Fish Symposium on Climate Change and Fisheries in 2020 contribute, contributed to um, scientific input given to negotiations into the UNFCCC. The policy fora and issues that emerged from our discussions were that the UNFCCC is probably the most frequently talked and most prominent uh, um, platform for ocean-related carbons in their discussions. However, there are serious concerns from stakeholders with regards to uh, uh, this framework. On the one hand, there's blue washing, which means that countries um, use existing ecosystems um, as, uh, as a grounds for, for their mitigation or consider them as mitigation contributions. The second is that um, it's not possible to replace emission reductions through um, ocean-related carbons. And for part, that is because they are temporary. So ocean car carbon is stored in the oceans for days, months, millennia, um, but they can always resurface and uh, get back into the atmosphere, unlike emission reductions, which have an infinite impact on uh, climate change. The second part is that mitigation actions uh, under the UNFCCC need to be associated with a single country and need to be quantified. And both of those pose severe challenges to ocean carbon, where mar marine species um, um, move along, uh, move around different areas. Um, and so any increase in their abundance, in their sequestration services would be very hard to associate with any single country. The UN Fish Stock Agreement um, might be a more promising outlet. Fisheries management um, in, by increasing in the abundance of fish populations, for example, could enhance carbon sequestration. And ecosystem-based approaches already now consider multiple ecosystem services of which carbon sequestration could be one in the future as well. The second agreement is on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, which is currently negotiated. It uses two policy or two prime policy instruments, uh, protected areas and impact assessments, which both could consider carbon. Uh, one open um, or one kind of DARF of research, which needs to be filled though, is there key species that contribute to carbon sequestration and um, carbon hotspots to be filled in into these policy uh, or to be effectively used in these policy instruments. The BBNJ also agreement also plays a role for unexploited marine species that contribute highly to carbon sequestration, such as mesopelagic species, um, because uh, in this way they could complement the fish stock agreement, 
which is mostly focusing on exploited species. As such, fish carbon uh, and ocean carbon highlights the multiple ecosystem services of fish and other marine species and their contribution to uh, well being. These will continue to be relevant for policy making. And so it's important for us to find the ways and places and fora where they can be inserted in a meaningful way and be governed in a comprehensive uh, manner. Thank you for listening. presentation is from Yvonne Ortiz, who is a senior research scientist and associate director at the Cooperative Institute for Climate, Ocean and Ecosystem Studies at the University of Washington. And Yvonne, Yvonne's paper is, is still in uh, preparation and hasn't been uh, published yet, but her paper really looks at the policy and management uh, tools that we can develop utilizing all of this science that the other scientists and researchers have really investigated. So what have we got available? How can fisheries managers actually apply this science? Hello, everybody. My name is Yvonne Ortiz, and I work at the University of Washington in Seattle in the United States. Um, and today, I'm going to talk to you about how to build a portfolio for climate mitigation and adaptation within fisheries management. And I would like to acknowledge all my colleagues who collaborated um, for this presentation. As Audrey has um, talked about the blue carbon and the cycle within the marine um, environment, what we are really talking about is a network where carbon is the currency. And if you think of this network, the more connections there are and the stronger those connections are, the more flexibility you have to actually adapt to climate change. And of course, the more opportunities in terms of economic activities and in terms of commercial species. Now, the important thing in the um, marine environment is to understand that there's a lot of carbon. And so there's carbon in the biomass of fish, carbon in the biomass of habitats, carbon within the sediments, and of course, carbon emissions via the vessels. And because the fisheries actually happen within this marine environment, they really have an impact on the marine carbon cycle. What this means is that we can really take fisheries management actions as a positive contribution to mitigate and adapt to climate change. And when we think about um, climate change and how to mitigate and adapt, we can really think of a suite of actions within fisheries management that we can take. Um, we can concentrate both um, on mitigation and adaptation where mitigation really focuses on reducing emissions and enhancing carbon sinks. And when we think about reducing emissions, we're really thinking about um, reducing overcapacity. So um, uh, reduce the number of vessels out there, shorten trips, using energy efficient vessels, um, changing the type of fuel that we use. And of course, we can also enhance carbon sinks. And if you think, of all the biomass that is actually in terms of uh, fish, marine mammals in the ecosystem on the water, when we fish, we actually are taking those um, carbon storage out of the water. And that is why one of the um, most effective mitigation actions for to enhance, enhance the carbon sinks is actually to reduce the amount of fish that we take out of the water. So we reduce overfishing, reduce bycatch, reduce discards, and um, also we can reduce the impact on the seabed, which if disturbed can also release carbon. On the adaptation side, we can actually reduce the harmful effects of climate change that is to reduce the vulnerability of the system and increase its resilience. And we can also reduce pollution. When we think about reducing vulnerability, 
vulnerability and increasing the resilience, we're really thinking of strengthening the ecosystem. So we're trying to protect habitats, um, maintain biodiversity, that is the number of connections and the strength of these connections, and um, to incorporate, we can incorporate climate information into stock assessments or uh, management strategy evaluations. And then, of course, we can also include um, climate information into a suite of other uh, policy instruments. And then in terms of reducing pollution, um, we're interested in reducing both biological and chemical pollution because the environmental effects or the detrimental effects of these pollutants are actually um, amplified by climate change. So by reducing the pollution, we actually reduce these impacts. And so we have actually put together a list of actions that then um, within a fisheries management process, folks can check and go through. And the way this works really is um, to really try to incorporate these actions as part of the regular management process. So by having this list of actions, you can really evaluate the actions, whether they're mitigating or adaptation, consider at what scale you're doing them from local, state to international. You can choose your policy instruments, whether those are quota settings or you can start with voluntary participation. And in reality, when you put them together, what you are doing is developing this portfolio and increasing the climate mitigation and adaptation. Once you have it instituted within the um, fisheries management process, then through the years, you really are accumulating these actions so that through time, you really are able to develop, maintain, and grow your portfolio and then increase the scale at which you are taking action, whether you start at the town um, or with communities and state and then grow them throughout the whole ecosystem and multinational. The intent is that over time, these cumulative effects um, will be a positive way of mitigating and adapting against climate change. Yes, that was it. I uh, didn't stop the recording at the exact moment with Yvonne, so I'll just spare you that. So if I could now invite the scientists and researchers up onto the stage, we've got time for a question and answer with our panel. So come on up, everyone. So as you can see, we have a different, I hope, hopefully people were taking or thinking about their questions as they go. Um, there's definitely, some very detailed and complex science that was um, presented very, very briefly um, and very efficiently. I just also want to highlight, in case anybody hasn't been watching, the amazing Iris Martin over here. She's been drawing. She's been drawing the uh, kind of key messages that, that the scientists have really um, been highlighting through their papers and she's done an amazing job. So we'll have those up for the rest of the afternoon. So I just essentially, I mean, this is there's a lot to take in there. Um, some pretty complex concepts, but also some big picture uh, ideas. So does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask our esteemed panelists? Unfortunately, we don't have a roving microphone, so I'll just repeat your question if you, if you have one and would like to. Yes, please go ahead. My name is Anthony Hapan, and I work with the Pan-African Vision for the Environment, an NGO based in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, we are currently working towards, due to the problem of uh, IEU fishing in the Gulf of Guinea, uh, we are currently working towards establishing an, uh, an uh, alliance against IU uh, fishing in Nigeria to try to support national plan of actions of the various countries and particularly Nigeria is the first 
coming up with his own plan. So I, I, um, this symposium was one of my targeted symposium for the Ocean Conference, and I'm really glad. That, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. So my, my, my comment is actually, we are seeking support and collaboration to, to make um, what we have in mind happen. And I've, I've written to Professor Rashid in the past, Nice. I came to see you personally. Yeah, yeah. And all that. So yeah, I'll be looking to, to your suggestion and how you can collaborate and support our efforts. Thank you. Thank you. It's very obviously very important uh, campaign that you're working on there to eliminate IUU fishing, which I think uh, a number of you identified the massive impact of IUU fishing on the state of fisheries, health of the ocean, and therefore its climate uh, resilience as well. Did you want to respond at all, Rashid? Yeah, just to say, yeah. Good to see you live. You know, we exchange emails, and so it's, it's good. We'll talk. IU is very important in the region, the Gulf of Guinea. And, and so thank you for your work, and uh, hopefully you pick up some collaboration here to strengthen that work. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so that's, uh, um, uh, it goes into the technical aspect of how we use uh, the, the models, simulation models, and the data set that generated from it to do the calculations uh, for the numbers that we presented. Um, so the, the models simulate uh, changes in, uh, in the fish stocks, uh, under fishing, and climate change. So we run uh, various fishing level and uh, various also um, um, kind of scenarios as well. So we generate um, the data set so that we can then uh, back calculate what the unexploited level of biomass would be if there is no fishing. So when we remove fishing, we know what the uh, biomass will, will build up to, as well as when we remove any global warming. Uh, so that uh, through the models, we set that theoretical pre-industrial um, unexploited level. So that's not based on observation, but we understand that we, we don't, for most of the fisheries, we don't actually have that much of a record dates back to an unexploited level. So that's based on the model simulations and then use it to create that, uh, uh, that uh, theoretical reference point. Thanks. Great, I did see another hand over there. Yeah. Good afternoon, my name is Rasish Mujero. I'm a member of the European Parliament. I would like to ask uh, question, I think everyone, if you feel there is a gap between the science and the data that is very clear on the management of fisheries, for example, and the ocean, and the policy makers and uh, the institutions that make the policy, uh, do you feel there's a gap? If, if there is, why does, it, uh, why does it exist that gap between the science, the data, the academia, and then the politicians then uh, the institutions? Or if it's everything working out fine, uh, we should continue as it is. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so I'll repeat the question. I'm sorry, we don't have a roving mic, but the question is, do you think that there is a gap between the science and the policy making, essentially, and the decision making? So I think you probably, a number of you would have an opinion on that. So um, um, Alex, would you like to start? I feel free to be critic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, I guess I'll talk from the point of view of the, the kind of ecosystem and blue carbon level. I think uh, essentially science is kind of catching up with that whole area. So uh, the scientists themselves are only just beginning to really focus on the roles of marine ecosystems, particularly the offshore ecosystems in terms of carbon sequestration. Um, Previously, the focus was really on uh, physical oceanographic um, mechanisms of 
uh, carbon sequestration, and then on uh, primary productivity, um, kind of passive sinking of carbon into the oceans. Now we're starting to focus more on the roles of actual organisms on, uh, on transport of carbon. That has a lot of implications, because if you think about the impacts of overfishing, and I'll give just one example here, one of the symptoms we often see in coastal ecosystems in temperate waters of overfishing are explosions in the number of sea urchins. And sea urchins eat macroalgal forests, so there you're seeing direct loss of carbon sequestration through the uh, um, uh, food web effects of, of overfishing. There's those sorts of things that we've got to really start thinking about in the context of fisheries management, but also broader management for marine ecosystems. Mike, why did you go up? My God. <laughs> so, so I was trying to say Alex actually talked about a situation where the science is not settled and where even the scientists are trying to understand it. So that's quite clear. There is a gap, right? And policymakers have to be sure before they take action. On the other hand, we know situations where the science is very clear, climate, subsidies and so on, and yet there's a gap between what politicians do and what scientists say. Why? There are all sorts of reasons. Sometimes reasonable reasons, but a lot of times it's the politics, you know? It, it, it's the lobbying, it, it's the corruption, right? All those things. And that is where everybody has to work, civil society. That's why we have NGOs pushing hard, right? And many times politicians have told me, all that you say makes sense to me, but here in this house for the four years, right? So that is politics, and that brings a gap. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to build on what Alex and Rashid just said. Um, even when the science is, is established and we know what's going on, the government themselves don't necessarily know what's going on. So I was talking about the report we're working on on subsidies. And Rashid actually wrote some really good papers where if you ask the governments, they are having subsidies to subsidize small-scale artisanal fishermen. Who in this room could disagree with that? Well, there's a reasons to, but um, but when we, what Rashid found was, sorry, I'm putting words in your mouth, was that actually a lot of the subsidies go to large-scale industrialized fleets. So there's, there's a problem with intent and execution. There are tools, so at the World Bank, we're, we're looking at public expenditure reviews, which really help the government dig in. Um, when, when you say you wanna help the sector and you wanna help them by subsidizing, um, you have to make sure that the subsidies are the right ones that do not necessarily enhance capacity, but rather help manage um, the stocks and and uh, um, and, and the fisheries. Um, yeah. Excellent question, Francisca. Thank you. Yeah, you tapped there into a question. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to add all of these points. I think there were super important. In addition, this con or this idea of the interface between climate change and fisheries is really something that has been born, I think, between interest groups and scientists. And so um, there's gaps on both sides that are still happening to grow. But I think what's really valuable and super important is that as we're um, advancing the science from the ecological side, from the economic side, we are also understanding which are the components of governance that actually can meet these needs. So which are the agreements, policy instruments that could actually be useful to uh, govern carbon sequestration and uh, climate change on fisheries. So we get this understanding at the same time which can guide scientists not to do just kind of this, not just following their interests and what they think is important, but really 
also channeling research towards more policy, uh, uh, towards policy questions and answering this. So I think that's happening at the same time. And the symposium and really this collaboration is one of the kind of key players in bringing this together. We just add to that, those are really good points. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, is the, uh, the gap between the climate and the ocean, and particularly in terms of fisheries, I think is the, uh, the need to blur, start to blur kind of the traditional uh, domains between different uh, ministry, between different governments uh, in many countries. I think for most of the countries, fisheries is managed by agriculture and kind of food, sec, uh, food ministry or department, while climate is on the environment department. They traditionally, like most government, they don't want to straddle into the other department of ministry. They have a really strict boundaries. Uh, and that creates a really difficult situation where they try to coordinate these kind of things, the things that we discussed. How can we include uh, solving overfishing, managing fishing, in, uh, in, in contributing to climate change? Those are the discussions that couldn't take place in government because of those traditional boundaries. So I think uh, there is a need to change and, and uh, of that uh, of the gap, uh, so that uh, some of these new ideas, new thinking, can start to emerge uh, in uh, and then build into actions uh, by the countries and by province and by the local government. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. And we actually have another event on Wednesday morning at eight thirty at Harvest Greens, where we will be discussing this exact question. So we'll have a couple of our scientists featured and representatives from the EU, from Germany. Uh, from Fiji, so we'll be really focusing in on that conversation in a lot more detail on Wednesday morning as well, if anybody else is interested in attending. Uh, if there are any other questions, you have a list. Maybe there's got another one at the back and then we'll come back to you. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah. Hi hey everyone, Jordan Jakutan from Global Action Accounts Partnership. We try to bridge the science policy gap through official statistics to go beyond GDP. My question is to the panel, but um, specifically Professor Alex. So if you understand the socks and flows of blue carbon, and in your opinion, where should blue carbon research go, and what's the end game? Is it a market? Is it credits? Where do we go with blue carbon? Okay, just to repeat that question. Um, so if you understand blue carbon, uh, where should, what, what is the end game in terms of where should the research go, and then what is the end game? Is it blue stocks, markets. credits, markets, etc. Alex. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, the first most important thing is that blue carbon is considered in terms of management of the, of the ocean. Uh, as William said, traditionally fisheries just haven't even thought about these broader ecosystem effects of, of fishing. Um, at the moment, certainly in my experience, they haven't got the, uh, the experience or the capacity uh, on board, certainly on scientific committees of RFMOs and national fisheries management bodies to even start to do that. So something has to happen in those bodies in terms of acquiring that capacity to really think about fisheries in a much broader ecosystem and climate context. Um, the whole area of markets is a, a minefield that I think scientists dare to uh, uh, walk into. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, if, if this is a pathway that helps to encourage uh, conservation and more importantly, restoration of marine ecosystems, then perhaps that is a, a path to consider, but it has to be in the context of local communities and commoners, the people who have a stake in those ecosystems. And it mustn't exclude them uh, from that, that process. So um, I think the answer to your question is both of, of the things you were referring to, but there are many, many factors to uh, consider when thinking about. Could add to say what is the end point? Um, the first thing I, I say is there's no one single end point. There are many things, there are many points that you can go with. Uh, from the economic point of view, and I think Alex, you touch a bit about that. What economic theory says is 
whatever you have and you're going to take a decision that will affect that thing or depend on that thing, you need to be comprehensive. You need to identify all the things that thing does to you or how it matters to you and incorporate them in your valuation, right? Uh, I told you that we take 100 million tons of fish a year out of the ocean. Why? We want to feed people, fine. We want to employ people, we want to earn income. But we tend to forget that the fish also does other things. It's questions carbon, does other services. So the first thing you do if you're doing proper economics, identify all the services you get, and then you do the valuation, so you do a sensible uh, decision there. That is what we are not doing. Alex and I, we did some estimate of high seas uh, carbon sequestration years ago. And what we found is that in terms of dollars, the value of sequestration is 10 times the value of the fish we catch and sell. So if you are doing proper economics, you better leave the, leave the fish in the ocean. It does more work for you. Right? This is what you are going to find if you really have a comprehensive understanding of our system. All right, these questions are really good. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't have the end game, but I, but I will share with you what I think it needs to look like. It's basically a cost-benefit analysis, and it's basically about winners and losers. So what you have is you have critical coastal ecosystems that repository of carbon, and the whole world needs, wants, wishes these countries to not destroy their mangroves, their seagrass, their uh, kelp forests, et cetera, et cetera. If they don't, it's gonna create a global good, a common good, which is gonna benefit all of us. If, on the other hand, a handful of coastal countries decide to destroy the mangroves, it's a global loss. The problem then is, you're absolutely right, we have to start with valuation, we need to know how much there is and how much it's worth. But then, ultimately, you wanna find a, a compensation, compensation mechanism whereby the winners, us, can compensate. I don't, I don't like the, 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 the phrase losers, but basically those who pay the cost of conservation. If you conserve your mangrove, you are foregoing some short-term, very real economic benefits. If you keep them, you help everybody with long-term, sustainable, ongoing benefits. So we all benefit from the fact that those mangroves are not being destroyed, but nobody wants to pay for that. And it goes to the point about the uh, local community. It has to trickle down. So I would say, let's slow down a little bit before we decide to have a mechanism or a market. Um, we need to know who, who, who gains, who pays the price, and then what kind of mechanism we can set up in order to compensate those who pay the price. Well, uh, let, let me, if there are more questions, that's good, right? so we get questions. Yeah, let's go for another question. I'm going to come back to you next. Uh, thank you. My name is Anna Metaxas, and I'm here with a few questions to your initiative. And my question has to do, it's interesting because I hear all of you talk about conservation, restoration, and fisheries management. And we also know that there are very strong opinions out there about marine protected areas and the role that they play or not play for uh, fishery management. And so I just would like your feedback in how do we Often, fisheries management is at odds with, with design and marine protected areas and conservation. There are maybe different departments, you know, where the marine protected areas could be imposed, and the fisheries people come in and say, well, the land is etc. So, I would like to hear your opinions on how do we reconcile, how do we bring this together, dealing with biodiversity, imposing biodiversity loss, and fisheries management in a more cohesive way. So um, I think that's a really good question again. Um, I think it is uh, not a, uh, a one or the other kind of uh, um, um, debate here. I think uh, it, it, there is a, uh, a, a need for a portfolio of solutions that uh, are implemented at the same time. But they can complement one another when it, they are uh, uh, well designed. So it is not like a, if we have fisheries management, we don't need marine protected area or vice versa. Uh, so they serve um, 
complementary purposes. Uh, for example, in, uh, in our simulation modeling analysis, we find that uh, having marine protected area in addition to fisheries, good fisheries management actually has uh, uh, exacerbated the benefits uh, and uh, in terms of achieving uh, rebuilding goals. Uh, and um, there are also um, specific uh, um, uh, objectives that marine protected areas can uh, achieve, like protecting uh, important uh, habitats that contribute to carbon storage and sequestration, uh, while there may be a other areas that are more uh, for the benefits of fisheries that are, 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 are better to be served with uh, a, a good fisheries management approach. Uh, so I think we need a portfolio of solutions so that we can achieve uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the objectives. And, and as, as the previous Rashid and Sherlock and Alex said, uh, we need to identify the, um, the, the cost and the impacts of these different uh, solution options. Uh, and then we design a portfolio that would best fit the situation to achieve conservation goals, climate goals, and other socioeconomic objectives. Uh, I really like the question that uh, it, it goes really deep, I think, to some of the core issues that we're facing in sustainability. Um, and I think it does, it triggers this thought of having to rethink a little bit on what, uh, what are we doing with our fisheries? Are we going to accept exploitative industries? Or should those go into other directions? So there's this new strands of thinking that are about regenerative development and those are not, haven't reached so much into the ocean world yet, but um, I think they can give us some new impulses to think on what do we think um, as a society, what is acceptable? Do we think that exploitation of the seas is something that we want to, uh, want to continue to accept or not? Uh, there are social norms that have shifted on other frontiers, such as smoking, for example, has been at least in Europe, it used to be very acceptable, and now it's not acceptable anymore. Uh, we are reducing uh, uh, traffic in the cities. These are more um, proximate uh, issues to, uh, to uh, societies. So I think one step is thinking about how something a bit more distant like the oceans can be brought into proximity to people to also really shift our social norms around how we think of exploitation in the oceans. And that could probably be one path to reconciling uh, these kind of frontiers between biodiversity conservationists and uh, the industry fishers, etc. at the same, same time. Yeah, I'll just then say something very short, really. I, I think we've got to shift from the perspective of competitive hunters exploiting ocean resources to planetary engineers really adopting a position of stewardship of what is the common property of, of everyone here and everyone else globally. Uh, that is going to demand absolute transparency about what industry is doing out in the oceans. We need to have a very clear understanding of what is being taken and where. At the moment, that transparency is not there. Um, and we really have got to take in this much broader ecosystem perspective in terms of all the other functions of the ocean and the benefits it's, it's providing us. Yeah, you know, this is... Okay. To reconcile fisheries management, you know what? Yeah. Maybe at the minimum, we should call this modern fisheries management. Why do I say this? Traditionally, most of our management systems were created mainly to find out how much fish people can take, the industry. That was the initial. And the, this is what we are struggling with when you talk about broader issues. So we should probably change this from fisheries management to ocean governance or ocean management. And, and make our systems understand. This is not just about how much fish you take. There are all these other things that you need to take about. So we need to push. Anna, good question. I know you are in the fight. This is not going to happen through Kumbaya. We just have to make the point and convince the system to go to ocean money. OK, I need to speak fast because I think I'm about to be cut off. I'd like, I'd, I'd like to bring it back to the people. And I'd like to bring it back to the fishermen. 
according to FAO, one in 10 jobs is uh, livelihood is dependent directly or indirectly on fisheries. So this is, this is who we're working for. These are our clients. Uh, we have food security issues. The World Bank's twin goals are to reduce extreme poverty and enhancing shared prosperity. Um, ocean capital is an undeniable reality. You just go to the islands of the Pacific and you're trying to eke a living or even to feed your population without fisheries, you're not going to be able to do that. We talk about MPAs. What does this mean? We talk about reducing capacity. It's very easy to talk about. What does it mean? It means people are going to lose their jobs. And it means fathers are not going to be able to feed their kids. So at the end of the day, no matter what we want to do, we really want to remember who we're working for. And again, it's about compensation. It's easy for us sitting here in Lisbon to come up with great ideas about how to reduce fishing. And it's going to be lives of people who often have no alternatives. There is a solution, economics to the rescue. There are going to be some gains that are going to be generated through this. Who's going to take those gains and compensate those whom we're going to ask, you can't go fishing here because it's an MPA, and you can't go fishing now because it's a closed season, and you can't fish anymore because we have too many boats. Shout out for the young, the, the little fishermen. Well, I just, I just wanted to roll onto the back of that because I have a microphone as well. But I just want to call in the concept of intergenerational equity because it's not just the decisions that's making an impact on the fishermen that's doing it right now, but it's also talking about the not just their family or their kids, but it's also the potential for all of our kids to access food or have a, you know, a healthy ocean that provides those ecosystem services. So I think we need to think in terms of scale, time scale as well. It's not just right now, it's you know, when our grandkids are big. I don't have grandkids, FYI. That means in the long term future. So I just, we started a little bit late, so I thought I would just allow one last question, if you had one last question, and then we'll wrap up and we'll be moving into the reception. Thanks, this one is more going to the reality of the fisheries management actually bringing it into practice. So we heard a lot of the golf presentations about the benefits of reducing capacity, and obviously we have a, a, a key general uh, interaction with the executives over capacity, but the benefits are kind of over Wow, I really just opened that up, didn't I? <laughs> um, I, I think we've got to bear in mind as to exactly where we are in terms of the ocean at the moment. Three quarters of oceanic shark species are under threat of extinction. And that is simply a result of overfishing. So if we don't do something very, very quickly, that the whole question of you know how these fishers can be affected is going to be moot because there's going to be nothing left for them to fish. Um, and I think also we've got to remember as to how we've got here, and that is through rent capture by corporate fishing industries and the people who are funding them. So in there for maximum short-term gain, extract as much profit as possible 
whether that's through in, uh, legal, illegal, or unregulated fishing, it's all being driven by the same thing. That situation cannot continue. So something's got to change. I, I haven't got an immediate answer. I think you've heard aspects of, of those answers here. But we've got to try and drive a wedge between sustainability here and this uh, you know, rent capture model uh, that somehow we've arrived at, or we don't know somehow, it's through a kind of neoliberal agenda driving uh, this industry. Um, you know, we, we've got to, got to try and move away from that system. Yeah, so, some great points from, from Alex here. I mean, the future and now, and Beck, you talked about that. You know something? You, you heard about Infinity Fish? Who hasn't heard about that? William will smile. He knows we can't finish this without me talking about that. <laughs> Infinity Fish is my book. You can Google it. And I, it's talking a, a lot about this, you know, how to actually balance the now and the future. And, and we have to find a way to do that. Otherwise, Alex, we want to keep all those people working. That means they won't work tomorrow, right? And people have told me this. I say, what will you feed them with when the fish is gone? They don't have an answer for that. Now, 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 right? Short term. And we have to deal with that. The thing is, we cannot solve the fisheries problem within the fisheries sector, in my view. We have to think broadly. So these days, I'm actually thinking about basic, universal basic income. If we really want to move the world, that's what you do. Give everybody basic income, then we can arrange the world such so that we get the most without people starving and dying. And that is where the thing is. We just have to tax the Elon Marks of the world and then we'll be fine. Don't tell him that, okay? <laughs> I think there's a, a complicated question um, that uh, depends on different contexts. But I think uh, for, like we had a, a, a uh, Rashid and I had a workshop uh, last, a few days ago that talked about like similar similar issues about uh, developing uh, ocean-based solutions for Canada. And I think one thing that we find is that there are uh, things that uh, we call safe bets. Uh, so those are the things that we know the current institution, there are current mechanisms that we can implement uh, that I think we should identify and that implement immediately. Uh, and that there are co-benefits, they contribute to climate solutions. Uh, no, there are things that are more of a, a wild tax solution. So it may be some of the, like, a, a, philosophical changes that we talk about or like a structural changes in the institutions uh, that I think is, can still happen. It is something not impossible, but it just is take, basically takes time, but then they may have a bigger impact. So if, if we start to identify these different um, interventions, uh, safe bet and wildcat, and then develop a, a, a plan to how, how to implement that, I think um, if we start now, I think it, 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 it is never too late to, to, to get something uh, um, implemented uh, in, in, um, a, to, to solve these big problems. I'm just going to, I'm going to call it right now because I also want to have the last word on that. As the NGO and as the activists or the campaigners or the people who've been tracking the decline of biodiversity and the ocean and acceleration of climate change for decades, we need to do every single thing we can as quickly as possible and that includes everything we can in the fisheries management in the fishing sector because otherwise we literally are facing the collapse of the planet and you know we don't really want to be dramatic about it but i think the latest ipcc report which william was an author on and and you guys have also got a raft of papers that really demonstrate this with pure science and economics we are on a trajectory that doesn't matter what the legal cost is in the next five years actually the cost to life on the planet and our societies and our communities is far greater and is you know, economically gonna be a multitude greater, right? So the point is we, we can see these, these challenges and I think the thing that's been really fantastic about today's symposium and the science is that there are solutions. There is a raft of solutions. We need to do everything that we can in every industry to decarbonize, to restore nature, to rebuild ocean health, to reinforce the capacity to mitigate and adapt to climate change. And fisheries management is a no-brainer for the ocean. It 
can not only deliver on climate, as the, we've heard from the scientists, but on biodiversity, it can deliver on food security, and it can help communities ensure there's going to be short-term things that we need to move through. But if we're going to make it in the long run, we really need to start changing the way we make those decisions. And as Rashid says, you know, take it out of just fishing. Take it out of just the fishing industry or out of just fisheries. This has ramifications for all of us, far beyond that one sector. So um, thank you so much to the scientists. It's been such a joy for us at Our Fish, an absolute privilege to work with you all over the last couple of years. It's been a, a long process. And um, we're really looking forward to sharing the entire series from the frontiers in marine science online. As Rashid mentioned, about eight of the papers have already been published and there's a few more to be published in the next two months. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming as well. At, at Our Fish, we not only believe in saving the ocean, but creating a more beautiful uh, world. And as such, we really believe in art and music and good food. <laughs> and we'd love for you to stay around and have a drink and enjoy some local music with us. Thank you very much for coming.